Right. So. Well, okay. Well, as, as well as, um, you know, the accusation of, uh, of arming insurgents within Somalia, there's also the mention of a border dispute within Djibouti. I mean, oh, how, how do you understand that situation? I mean, I think a lot of people might not even know where Djibouti is and its particular significance. Could you um, give us some information on that? Um, again, all we know is that Djibouti accused uh, Eritrea of invading it. Uh, Eritrea countered that accusation. The UN Security Council asked for a fact-finding mission. Eritrea blocked it. So again, it's very difficult to ascertain what happened. Human rights, uh, or, uh, human rights organizations have had reports of, um, uh, of prisoners of war who have been, Eritrean prisoners of war who have been interviewed within Djibouti. So it, it is very difficult to ascertain what did happen and what level of conflict has uh, taken place with Eritrea's obstruction. And how do you respond to the assertion by um, um, Thomas there in Eritrea that it was Ethiopia, in effect, that was found, evidentially, to have um, armed insurgents? Yeah, I mean, uh, as, as we've been saying just before we came um, on air, actually, politics is such a murky business, and I don't trust any of the governments in that region. But uh, having said that, I can only speak from an Eritrean perspective as a person, as an Eritrean who has been, uh, uh, who, who has been blocked by my own government uh, from getting the information that I require. I look to my government to uh, provide uh, provide me with assurances that they haven't been involved and it is my government unfortunately that has been hosting these organizations in Eritrea where Eritrean opposition groups are not allowed. Eritrean opposition groups are not allowed in the country. Eritrean human rights organizations are not allowed in the country and yet um, insurgent groups from all over the region are hosted and supported well, by Eritrea. Well, the, a lot of Eritreans living outside of Eritrea were protesting in Geneva and uh, you were one of the organizers of that event, um, Sirak. Yeah. Could, could you just give us a little bit of a brief on what happened on that day and the kind of thinking of uh, the audience that came out? Yeah, well, it's uh, truly uh, a remarkable uh, day. Uh, well, Eritreans all over the world. It's not. It was not only in Geneva, mm. but it was also being held um, in parallel on the same day in Washington D.C., in San Francisco, and also in Australia. Uh, and tens of thousands of Eritreans came. Uh, from the Geneva point of view, um, we had people coming from at least about 13 different countries in Europe. So strong uh, some, feelings. Some yes. people driving for more than 28 hours from Norway towards to Geneva. Mm. So they were there basically to show uh, uh, the world or the United Nations and especially the United States uh, that what they're doing uh, in Eritrea and in the Horn of Africa is not fair, it's unjust and it's illegal uh, because they haven't shown any evidence uh, that, uh, to, uh, to accuse Eritrea of what they've been doing. Uh, and they're using their military uh, and um, um, diplomatic and economic prowess to show mm -hmm. that, um, that Eritrea has been actually the, uh, the, 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 the country which is creating these problems. Well, the we're, we're, is the truth. we're going to get into some discussions around how, why you have that perception and some evidence perhaps that you can give us. But let's uh, give a word um, to you, um, Thomas, there in Eritrea. It's been three months. Um, has there been any impact, you know, with regard to the sanctions? And, and do you feel, if they continue, that Eritrea can tough it out? Well, there's been a long history of sanctions, both official and unofficial, against Eritrea. Uh, when, for example, when Ethiopia invaded us in June 2000, the UN Security Council imposed an arms embargo on Eritrea, which was being invaded. So, I mean, uh, there's been these unofficial sanctions. The U.S. And, has been trying in every way it can to prevent the... Uh, Eritrea from getting loans to help develop self-sufficiency programs in Eritrea. They've been trying to block all kinds of aid to Eritrea. I mean, for example, when uh, we had the big uh, record-breaking two-year drought in 2003-2004, the Western aid agencies were prevented from providing any more than about 5 or 6 percent of the, of the food aid we needed. Eritrea had to go out and buy all this aid during this big uh, record-breaking drought. So, I mean, we've been through some really hard times here. Are people and particularly are suffering better. right now, though, Thomas, as a result well, of those it, sanctions? I can't say times aren't hard because we had a drought last year, you know. So, I mean, every time there's a drought, the government has to come out and feed all these people, and, and, and that makes it hard on, on everything. But the times are getting better. I've been in Osmada since 2006, and, you know, Salam Kadani's never been in Eritrea. I see it firsthand every day. 
life is slowly getting better here, but mainly it's getting better in the villages. Mm-hmm. There's really dramatic changes in the villages where they're getting clean drinking water, they're getting schools, they're getting medical clinics, they're even getting electricity and roads. Life is really changing for the better in Eritrea. It's slow, but it's really it's, it's taking place. And uh, I okay. don't see these sanctions as being anything more than pretty much toothless. I don't really see them uh, hurting the country at all. Well, thank you very much. But uh, as we hear so little about Eritrea, as we've already alluded to the fact that perhaps a lot of people don't know about the country, the second part of the discussion today will go some way towards fill, filling that information gap. But before that, here's a timeline of some key events in Eritrea's history. Eritrea came under the colony of Italy from 1890 to 1941. In 1952, UN makes Eritrea part of Ethiopia. Eritrea Liberation Front, ELF, formed to break away from Ethiopia in 1958. In 1970, ELF splits and the Eritrean People's Liberation Front created. Eritrea becomes independent and joins United Nations in 1993. From 1998 to 2000, Eritrea-Ethiopia border clashes killed over 70,000. In 2000, Eritrea and Ethiopia agree ceasefire. 2001 saw Eritrea and Ethiopia agree on a UN proposed mediation over border dispute. Boundary Commission rules disputed border town of Badme is in Eritrea in 2003, but Ethiopia disagrees. In 2004, Ethiopia accepts ruling on its border with Eritrea, but stalemate over Badme continues. In 2006, U.S. report accuses Eritrea of providing arms and supplies to rival Islamist groups in Somalia. Eritrea denies the charge. U.N. imposes sanctions on Eritrea in 2009. As you could see there, there's been a long history of conflict between Ethiopia and Eritrea. But I'd like to ask you there, um, you heard Thomas earlier on saying that you've never been to Eritrea, but I'm sure you're aware of the history um, of Eritrea and the long conflict with Ethiopia. How much of a factor is that in our discussion today as we look at sanctions? I think I'd like to um, tell Thomas that I have been to Eritrea several times, many times indeed uh, in my life. I wasn't born there, uh, but I partly grew up there, so I know Eritrea quite well. Um, and I would like to go back and live in Eritrea, actually. Um, and I, but I would like to be able to operate as, 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 as the human rights activist I am, freely in Eritrea. That's the only thing mm -hmm. keeping me away from Eritrea at the moment. Um, uh, what can I say? Uh, the sanctions will have impact. They, they, will, they, they will have impact, but at the moment, the way they are uh, targeted on the government and its operatives, I don't see it uh, harming the people. In fact, it's the government of Eritrea that barred uh, hum uh, humanitarian organizations and uh, evicted many uh, aid agencies from the country. Very few aid agencies remain, and their operations are curtailed severely.